June, it is such an honor to be here at the Challenger Center in Chattanooga with you and to have an opportunity to talk with you about your new book, Silver Linings. Um, June Scobie Rogers, you have had such an incredibly rich life, not easy, um, but certainly inspiring. And I love this book. It's um, my life before and after Challenger 7. And you've had uh, a lot before and after. Thank you for taking this time. Um, but thank you, Becky, and I've had a great life, one better than I deserve. <laughs> thank you. Well, you know, events do shape our lives, uh, without a doubt. And you're, in the book, your early life was definitely shaped by your mother's illness um, and also your uh, having to move a lot. Um, describe that early life a little bit for us. Oh, my goodness. I, um, there was some joy in my early life. Um, my mother introduced me to books that was wonderful, so I, I don't want it to I, seem to be so terrible. But my mother had mental illness. Um, she was ill while I was a young teenager, but we didn't know until later that it was identified as schizophrenia. Uh, and she had a very difficult time with that illness prior to their understanding uh, the medication that could help. Um, my father was an itinerant carpenter, and we, so we moved from one spot to another, uh, either because he was looking for a job, or because my mother left my dad, or all these other different reasons. But uh, we knew it was sad news when he'd come in, or my mother would come in and say, pack everything you want to carry in a, in a, in a, in a Paper grocery bag, bag right? in a grocery bag, and that's all we could take is what would fit in that grocery bag. And we'd pile it in the car and move on. Sometimes a dozen times a year, and we'd live <laughs> we'd live at roadside parks or in homeless situations and at bus stations, all kinds of of um, rugged areas. But there was always a silver lining somewhere along the way. <laughs> well, it's amazing to me, you, you grew up in a time where girls were not necessarily encouraged to take math and science, yeah. and yet you had a desire and a dream and a love for those subjects and for the stars. And uh, How did you find that, especially with having to move so much? How, how were you able to encourage someone to give you that chance? Oh my goodness, it was, um, I, I was, I guess I was blessed early on to know if you talk to someone about what is important to you that perhaps there's a, an adult out there that would help you. Well, I did confiscate the A encyclopedia to read all about aerospace and astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a as great a, story. As, a, as a youngster, um, but um, uh, it, about the time I was 16 and so interested in all of the science and math and working through the Sputnik era curriculum where they finally allowed girls to go into the sciences. Uh, that's when I met Dick Scobie. And we, um, on our first date, shared the enthusiasm of the stars, talking, uh, sitting out under that umbrella, stars in the sky. And he loved airplanes and I could talk to him about uh, the camber on the wing and what caused the lift. And I think he was surprised that a girl knew about these things. But in, anyway, um, it was a joy to um, have an opportunity to learn about these um, programs. Some of the moves that I thought were devastating turned out to be good because of where we were located, near uh, Huntsville, where they were building the rockets, or near uh, Palm Beach, or uh, in Florida, mm -hmm. near uh, the Cape, where they were launching them. So. Right. It was always in the news, and I could read the newspaper and learn about these opportunities. And one of those moves did take you back where you did have the opportunity to meet Dick Scobie. Yes. Right? And yes. Oh, um, how I, I didn't want to leave Florida where all of this joy of the sciences. Um, but we did have to move. I didn't want my mother to have only my brothers in case she was sick. They were all younger. Mm -hmm. And um, that summer at our church, Dick Scobie came up to a um, little hayride that the youth counselor was putting on, and that's how we met and enjoyed our, our common interest in space and um, airplanes. 
And you've described him as, as your soulmate. As, uh, <laughs> you guys have a beautiful relationship. You know, one of the things I love about this book is, I'm, of course, I know Commander Scobie mm -hmm. uh, from The Challenger, and, uh, and as most people probably would. But I didn't know him as a person, and yes. you really feel that in oh, this book. Oh, good, good. So thank you for that. He was, I knew he was a good man at the very beginning of our old-fashioned courtship mm -hmm. because he invited my brothers who never had a chance to go to the movies. He would invite them to go with us. Um, and that told me something special about this man. He was good. He was a good person. Lots of integrity. Um, and, joy, and, and cared so much about me and my mm -hmm. interests. He, he was a very giving, kind person. And um, so much that I could share a, about him. You always wanted to teach, and uh, he did encourage you to go on and go to college. You have a PhD. Um, you've done so much, and, uh, and the Challenger Centers are one of extension of that, yes. certainly. Uh, and we, we are going to have a chance to visit the Challenger Center here in, in Chattanooga with you, so I'm excited about that. Let's talk just briefly about the Challenger 7, because I know that also is an event that certainly um, that we all lived. Yes. Um, at that time, public television, were, we were going to air the teacher in space segments, yes. and I was the director of educational services at our station, so I was responsible for that project locally. And so I was watching at the same time you were experiencing and just devastated, as our country was devastated yes. at the explosion of that. That had to be such a hard moment for you and all of the families, and yet I know you've said your faith made a huge difference. Yes. Share, and share that. Yes, it's 25 years since we lost the Challenger. Um, and uh, just next week we have a, a conference bringing all of our flight directors from these centers and all of the Challenger families together and the children who've grown up. We're all coming together to celebrate this mission that continues. But um, I think to, to really share the story of why it came about, I, I need to begin with Dick Scobie's first flight in space. Um, we cared so much about each other, his finally getting to fly airplanes and then being selected as a test pilot, astronaut, uh, and then flying in space. Uh, When he returned from his first flight, um, there were reporters and neighbors all wanting to talk with him. But he said, June, I want to tell you first what it was like to fly in space because you believed in me when mm -hmm. no one else would. And um, it, was a, it was an extremely important flight. That's why all the reporters wanted to talk with him. It was uh, the first time the shuttle actually came up near to a satellite, so they rendezvoused, and they had to be quite careful not to bump each other and right. so forth. So it was a very important flight, but he wanted to talk with me first, so we went to our favorite restaurant, and there the stars shined in the sky no brighter than his eyes, but he, he kept uh, stuffing his napkin under his dinner plate, and I said, what, what's that about? And he said, oh, I felt like I was still in space. You know, it was only five hours before that that he was weightless, oh. and and he was tucking everything. Um, and then he took out the camera to take a picture of us, and j because he'd been handling all the big camera equipment, IMAX and everything, they took the pictures, made the movies, and set it aside, and it floated. Well, he took our picture and it set it aside, and it can crash <laughs> down. He says, oh, yes, I am back to 1G. Um, <laughs> But then he told me what it was like to fly in space and the joy and of the mission and the success. But I said, didn't it make you mad that President Reagan on national television mentioned everyone's name but forgot your name? He said, no, what was important was the mission. The mission was successful. The mission is what it was all about. So now he's come back with a successful mission as the pilot, mm -hmm. a challenger. And within months, he's assigned as the commander of a Challenger flight with this marvelous crew and a, a wonderful mission. And then we're surprised with this teacher competition. 
Krista McAuliffe from New Hampshire is named to fly on his mission. So this mission began to grow beyond NASA to a national and worldwide interest mission. And I'm on top of it all with, I, I'm a teacher, I can identify with it. And I was certain that they assigned him as the commander because he loves teachers. <laughs> um, so much so that after I got my PhD on the mailbox at home, he, he, where everyone knew him as astronaut, he put Mr. and Dr. Scobie. That's you great. Know, so he, he was as proud of my being a teacher as I was of, him, of his flying aircraft and space shuttles. So tremendous enthusiasm for the nation. Mm -hmm. um, I adopted Krista, mm -hmm. arms are embraced around her and Barbara. They came to my home and spoke to my college students at the time I was teaching college. And I gave them, to them a plaque that said, to teach is to touch the future. Well, Krista asked me about that anonymous quote and she coined it for herself. I teach, I touch the future, mm -hmm. which became a national motto for all teachers. Um, well, you can imagine the joy of that crew training together, working with uh, Krista to fly her mission, all the educators around the world waiting for someone representing her to fly in space. Um, so our most joyful, unbelievable experience within seconds changed to devastation and um, traumatic for for the entire nation, not just, not just people who were concerned about heroes, but especially for the families who lost mothers and fathers and sisters and daughters. Um, so within weeks, the families came together in my home and we said, now oh, Dick told me the mission is what's important. Can we continue the mission? Can we create an opportunity for kids to do something that they loved and the lessons, can we continue the lessons? So they said, sure, June, you're the teacher. You, you're, you're the chairman and go make this happen. But they were very supportive and together uh, we created the idea of the Challenger Center for Space Science Education. And those are, those. it's not just one center though. I mean, you've created those all over. In, yes. And they're usually placed on college campuses, I believe? A, a third of them are, are on college campuses. That, that's to inspire the youngsters who are, and the educators who want them to think about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. Encourage that. Um, but many are located at science museums, science centers, museums, and some are standalone, major museum centers themselves, and uh, some are located in schools. A school superintendent said, I want one of these for my school, or a museum director. And sometimes a congressman comes in and says, I want one for my district. The one built in Manhattan in New York City. The congressman said, what do you mean these kids have to go to New Jersey? We want one in New York City. So the congressman had one built in New York City. Well, I think it's important. I think, and it's so we're so fortunate to have one here in Chattanooga. Yes. And and let's take you know, I, I want to, I do want to come back to your faith because you do have yes. phenomenal faith. Um, but let's move to why you're in Chattanooga, <laughs> because a next phase of your life, out of tragedy, at some point, came another opportunity for love and life with a new man. I, as I said, I've been blessed more than I deserve. Um, and it's all a part of my faith. I met Dick Scobie at a church, mm -hmm. right? And Easter at a sunrise service at Arlington where Dick Scobie was buried and where this wonderful gentleman had told me that his wife had died and um, had had her service at Arlington. And this bright um, general that had some pain in his, on his face because of a recent loss of his love. We became fast friends and his name was General Rogers from Cookville, Tennessee. <laughs> and all of these people that were with, with us that knew him said, yes, he's throughout the army. He's known as Thurman D from Tennessee. <laughs> um, we became fast friends. My children absolutely adored him. My son's military, my daughter, 
uh, having grown up with mm -hmm. military, we they loved Don Rogers as much as I did, and his sweet son um, and family. So we all got to know each other. We came to Cookville, and Cookville was a breath of fresh air. And we said, where? his mother said, would you marry my son and bring him back to Tennessee? <laughs> so we shopped around Tennessee to see where to live in Chattanooga. Uh, was a treasure. We loved Chattanooga. It was not only a tourist destination, but our home destination. Right. So we moved to, Ch to Chattanooga. That's so great. And, and I know all of our region know, they know Don Rogers and, and uh, yes. what, a, what a joy. And what a joy for us yes. to meet you. Yes. Uh, it's just been a wonderful. Well, yeah, I can say everyone loves Don Rogers. He does not meet a stranger, but I love him the most. There you go. That's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of uh, your faith is tremendous, and it's and it resonates in your book, and it's a blessing to those yes. who read this book. Um, a lot of, and you talk about the fact that people have to deal with loss in many forms, whether it's yes. divorce or death or, or yes. even moving. It's a loss. Yes. So, what can, what can you share with folks about how to deal with that loss? And you had to deal with it publicly, but regardless, it's still yes. there. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know how anyone gets through a tragedy in their lives without a church family. And many times in my life I had a church family. But um, one of the m most rewarding opportunities for me was when I was that little nine-year-old child um, who felt so helpless and homeless. and. Um, a family friend gave my mother a book by Norman Vincent Peale titled The Power of Positive Thinking. And I, I, that book was simple enough that as a nine-year-old I could take the words and put them into um, a use for myself to help me go through life. And I coined it my ABCs. And A was for attitude, to accept who you are and where you live in your life um, and forgive those. Um, people who've done harm to you. Uh, and B was to believe in yourself, no matter how many times people put you down. Believe in yourself, but most of all, believe in a power greater than yourself. That's when I learned that God was bigger than those stars that I prayed to. God was bigger than the universe. And that power of knowing how great God was kind of gave me uh, a power of faith that went beyond a little childhood image of God on a throne. And then C was for commitment, to have the courage to make a commitment in your life. And as I grew older, D became dreams. And not only my own dreams, but to become a dream maker, to help others with their dreams. So that's a part of what the Challenger Center STEM programs are all about, is to help children with their dreams. Well, and I, I thank you for sharing your <laughs> dreams, your stories. We could talk for hours, I feel. I just, I love it. I want the folks to get this book, Silver Linings, uh, by June Scobie Rogers. You're going to love it. It's inspiring. Uh, it's What we've talked here today is a fraction of the incredible stories <laughs> in this book. You're not finished yet, though. We are, we are going to take a little quick tour of the Challenger Center here. But before we leave, I want you to tell me briefly about what you're working on now. You have children's book series oh my goodness, yes. that you're doing. Yes, this is so exciting. Um, the Star Challengers are children who come to a Challenger Center and they meet the mysterious Commander Zota, who takes them on a real-time machine into the future. We have uh, publ published two, and the third one's at the printer now, so it's a trilogy. But the reason I can brag about them and say they're so good is my co-author is the famous Kevin Anderson, who has more science fiction books on shelves in bookstores than any science fiction author. Um, he's great, and the story is fun, and children that read it get excited. They're ready to go on their own space trips. All right. Well, we're going to be ready to go on a little space trip here <laughs> with you at the Challenger Center here in Chattanooga. Thank you, June, for sharing with us, and let's take a tour. Okay, Becky, let's go. So what room is this? This is Mission Control. Um, mission Controllers from NASA helped us design this room. So this room is paired with the space station simulator that's across um, in space, mm -hmm. uh, supposedly. But we have every, every station that's in the space station is represented here by mission controllers, the students. Uh, 
actually help them with their mission. As do they, they do a simulated? Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. their missions are to the moon or to Mars or they save planet Earth on their mission. So they know what their mission is. And they're assigned jobs, so they become communicators, a navigator. We have a medical doctor who manages the, manages the health of the crew. Uh, research folks, so there's something wrong. A loss of oxygen, life support, loss of red lights, flash, sirens. Oh, wow. and, and so they, what do we do? So they have to call NASA, Mission Control, to help them solve the problems. Oh, that's great. So, so they work together as a team. So half the class of students are, are in the space station and the other half are in mission control. Halfway through the mission, they get to change. So everyone can fly in space. They have to be so inspired. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You should see that. I mean, they're on top of everything. And, and then our evaluations at the end of the year, the end, at, the, after, at the end of high school, is our greatest field experience was to the Challenger Center. Time and time again. I mean, it's like 95%. Wow. So That's it's, great. it's, and we don't even serve popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, let's now. You don't anywhere in the building, right? No. They don't even get it in the shuttle. No, they can they can eat outside. <laughs> I know. All right, well, let's go to the next spot, because okay. that's where they, do, from here, do they also get in the shuttle? They fly in a shuttle that takes them up to the space station. Okay, let's check that out. Okay. Right, now we're out here for the shuttle, right? <laughs> yes, for the yeah, shuttle. This is it. exciting. Um, because this is a university campus, mm -hmm. we partnered with the College of Engineers. So the College of Engineers designed this shuttle, the electronics, built it, the whole business, for their senior project. Oh, a tremendous cool. opportunity for a hands-on experience for these uh, seniors. And um, every Challenger Learning Center has a different process to get the students from Earth to the space station. This is what the College of Engineers created here, thanks to the Caldwell Foundation of Chattanooga. It was a marvelous That's opportunity great. for us. This is incredible. Tell me what this is. <laughs> this was in our home. Dick Scobie had put together uh, all of the pictures of the, of the planes that he had flown mm -hmm. as a test pilot, and he asked if I could arrange them for him. These are the patches that they wear on their shoulder. Every one of these he flew with the X-24 prototype, and that prototype plane is what opened the door for him to become an astronaut because he flew the prototype that would be the forerunner of the shuttle, space shuttle. He also flew the 747 with a shuttle piggyback. That was a little star duster that we flew together that I got to fly. Did you fly that? Oh, yes, you little, did, didn't little you? open cockpit by wing. You know, you put on goggles and your helmet and everything, you can go out and fly. And your son Barney learned to Sturman. fly that? Yes, right? yes, our whole family. Our daughter didn't pick up on the joy of flying as much yeah. as everybody else. Um, but she she's, uh, has gifts and talents in other areas. But you have a great funny. story about flying over Paris with that, right? <laughs> yeah. He had to fly over Paris. He got to, f in the Paris Air Show, yes. he was able to, fl he was invited to fly this around the periphery of Paris. Oh, so wow. I climbed up the Eiffel Tower and watched the, as they went around on the, with this great big bow wing. It's tremendous. It's bigger than a ship to wow. look up at it. Wow. Uh, All right. Now, we gotta, <laughs> now we've got to fly to the space okay, station. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, this is exciting. I feel like I'm on Star Trek. <laughs> You're welcome to the space station. The okay. Space okay. Station. Wow. <laughs> this is so cool. So is this just like a space station? Oh, well, we created it before the space station was created. No, no. It's um, a wonderful mock-up of what a space station, a spacecraft would do to have their um, opportunities to conduct scientific investigations. Mm -hmm. Um, we have all kinds of opportunities for isolation. They use little robots in case the materials are dangerous. And a probe room where, this, where the youngsters build a probe and launch it to collect data from a comet, from mm -hmm. Halley's Comet. Uh, medical, the medical team takes care of the health of the crew, life support, um, manages all of the air and the water and uh, comfort of temperatures and so forth so they have big emergencies and when they have emergencies the red light flashes and the sirens come on and then data the communicators uh, whether it's written or by voice mm -hmm. the capsule communicators are in touch with the mission control with what do we do how do we solve this problem 
So they go back and forth with helping each other. It's an exciting, it's an exciting time. I've had reporters go over to the navigator and ask for information about what he's doing. So, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'll, we'll get lost in space if I look, you know. So, so they won't even answer the questions. They're so intent on on their mission and what they are accomplishing. They want it to be successful. Um, it's exciting. This, this has been such a joy and unfortunately we're out of time. <laughs> so we just need to come back and experience it for real yes, again. Yes, come, right? back, come and, back and fly with these children. Uh, I think that's what Or adults. Doing. Adults have birthday parties. One man, uh, 90 years old, wanted to bring his wife to fly her to the moon for his birthday. He said, oh. I promised her if she'd marry me, I'd take her to the moon and now this is my chance. That's great. Okay, <laughs> I'm planning a birthday party. I hope you guys are too. Thank you, June. Get the book and thanks for watching 101. One.